coalition form. Uh, there you'll be able to be connected with a mental health professional um, who can address any concerns that you may have um, in the right way. And of course, if you're in any immediate danger or you have an emergency, please dial 911. Okay, so we're gonna just jump right into it. We've all been hearing a lot about coronavirus these days. COVID-19 is actually a strain of the coronavirus. Uh, it's not a human virus and it causes respiratory illness. Um, the symptoms are very similar to that of the flu, but obviously more severe. They include cough, fever, difficulty breathing, um, and at the time, there is no vaccine developed, which is why uh, it's such a big deal right now. Um, it primarily spreads through droplets, so discharge from the nose, saliva, um, coughing or sneezing, um, or touching areas that those droplets may have been in contact with all contribute to the spread of the virus. Um, well, how serious is the situation? It's pretty serious. Uh, the World Health Organization has declared COVID-19 a global pandemic, which is not used lightly. Um, this means that there's no pre-existing immunity to the disease as it spreads rapidly between people worldwide. Um, all countries have responded to COVID-19 in different ways, but the U.S. is currently in a state of national emergency in response to the pandemic, which has caused many states to go into a quarantine to prevent the spread. Um, a lot of public events such as sports, concerts along with even people's jobs and universities have been closed um, due, due to the quarantine to keep up with the guidelines the government has been giving to practice that social distancing. Currently Chicago is in quarantine until at least the end of April and a lot of other places are in a similar situation if not worse. So we all know how many negative effects the coronavirus has on our physical health, but what we're really here to talk about today are some of the negative effects that it can have on our mental health. So by nature of the virus, we are being told to distance ourselves socially, uh, which inevitably results in many of us feeling more lonely in this time away from many of our friends or our loved ones. Um, this can lead to depression or the worsening of certain mental health issues that some of us may have been dealing with before the outbreak happened. Um, another factor to consider when talking about mental health during COVID-19 is the anxiety um, due to just how severe the whole outbreak has been. A lot of people's lives have been turned upside down and that is a cause for a lot of fear and uncertainty which are two major sources of anxiety. Um, people who would otherwise be seeking treatment for mental health issues also do not have the same access to those resources uh, with all of us being stuck in our homes. Uh, there are solutions to that, which we'll be getting into later, but it's definitely an important uh, thing to keep in mind when discussing mental health during this time. Um, as many of us know, the situation of mental health in America is already pretty severe, uh, depression, generalized anxiety and panic disorder are all very prevalent in the country and it might only get worse with coronavirus. So here we just have a few statistics to really show how many people are affected by these disorders. And you can go ahead and just take a second to read over those before we uh, go on to the next slide. I'm gonna go ahead. So as I mentioned earlier, there are still resources that are available during this time and we've put them together on this slide here. Um, a lot of these are local to Chicago and also Muslim specific. So if you wanna go ahead and jot these down or take a screenshot, um, we'll give you a couple of seconds to do that. We'll also be sending out an email uh, after our session today with this PowerPoint and some resources. So make sure to uh, be on the lookout for that. Um, these resources are really beneficial in these times, so please share them with your family, share them with your friends, um, and inshallah we can all take care of each other in this time. Finally, uh, just everyone remember to stay safe, stay healthy, and most importantly, stay sane. Um, we're now going to go on to our panel discussion. Uh, and I'd like to give this time to let all of the panelists introduce themselves and we can go ahead and start with Dr. Yasmeen. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Dr. Yasmeen Khan and I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. I'm here representing 
Islamic Center of Naperville Family Support Services. I also have a private practice called Self Empowerment Center. And then we can go on to Dr. Fahad Khan. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. This is uh, Fahad Khan. I'm um, the deputy director at Khalil Center and a licensed clinical psychologist um, as well. And then uh, Sister Fatima. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Fatima Mohammed from the Nigerian Islamic Association. I teach Quranic and Islamic studies. And Kanan. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. My name is Hanan. Uh, I'm the vice president of Project Takwa, and I also am a third year neuroscience student at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Okay, and then last but not least, Chris. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Chris. I am a student in my last semester at UIC. Um, I'm studying political science, and I'm here representing the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition. Okay, thank you all so much for being here and introducing yourselves. Um, at this time, I'd like to give the floor to our clinical psychologist, uh, Dr. Yasmin Khan, uh, to just lead us in an exercise to center ourselves really quick. Dr. Yasmin, you can go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Sabrina. So let's work on quietening our mind. Make yourself comfortable wherever you're sitting down. Plant your feet firmly on the floor, the ground, your head held high. and begin to turn your awareness to your breath without trying to change it. Follow your breath to the full length of the inhale and the full length of the exhale. Feel the energy coming into the body along with the movement of the breath. Feel it flowing from the top of the head towards the bottom of the feet, relaxing and releasing any tension, any tightness you may be holding in the body. And as it flows down all the way to the feet, it doesn't stop there. It continues into the ground underneath you like roots growing from your feet, flowing deep into the ground and feel the energy from the ground underneath you coming into the body through those roots, flowing up towards the head. Again, relaxing and releasing any tension, any tightness you may be holding anywhere in the body. It goes in and around the heart, coming up towards the head from where it branches out into the space above you. Feel the energy coming from the space and everything above you through those branches, from your head, into your body, in and around your heart, and mixing with the earth energy that is already flowing in the body. You're planted firmly like a strong tree with your roots in, your ground, in the ground and your branches soaring into the sky. You're connected, calm, centered, focused, strong, ready to withstand all the climates, all the weather, just past the winter and the spring is in the air. Within the next few breaths, in your own time and your own pace, you can return your attention into this room, bringing this calmness, connectedness with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Yasmeen. I'm sure we all appreciate feeling a bit more relaxed before getting into our discussion. Um, I think we can go ahead now and dive into our discussion. Uh, and we can go ahead and start with our first scenario. But before we start, 
Uh, I would like to remind everyone that while we're doing the panel, uh, please feel free to leave your comments and questions in the forum below, as well as on our Instagram Live, and we can hopefully weave those questions in between our preset discussion questions as well. So um, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and read our first scenario, and then our panelists can go ahead and respond. I have always struggled with feeling lonely. Recently, I finally started to make friends. Now, with this crisis going on, I feel intense sadness and isolation. My family says to suck it up and be a man. I do. And uh, if Dr. Yasmin would like to go ahead first. Thank you, Sabrina. So this seems to be a young man who has already who ha was already struggling with feeling lonely, and but he was over uh, able to overcome the struggle because he was making friends. But now his life has turned upside down and he's feeling that loneliness all over again. Um, and of course the family is saying to suck it up, he's a man and he's supposed to know how to handle his feelings. So um, this is, you know, um, depression versus loneliness. That's a very good question. Is it plain depression? See, there is a difference between sadness and depression. This is a very difficult situation for everybody. So everybody is feeling sad, angry, frustrated. But where does it take you from the sadness into depression is the hopelessness and the helplessness. And I'm wondering if he is feeling that hopelessness and helplessness, which is getting into the depression and also the loneliness. Yes, he is feeling lonely because um, he is alone uh, in this um, isolation. But the important point for all of us is to know that the alone does not mean that it would lead to a loneliness. The alone is the physical experience and loneliness is the psychological experiences. You can, he's asking what to do. Yes, he can figure out, we all need to figure out new ways to connect because we are all social beings and we need to stay connected. But this is a time that we could figure out what would be other ways to connect. He's with his family, so perhaps he can figure out uh, how to connect with his family in a different way when he is physically sharing the space, which could be also challenging, and connect with the people that he doesn't meet, he doesn't see often, uh, social media, phone, um, and all these other creative avenues. Dr. Fahad, would you like to give some insight as well? Um, yeah, you know, I want to uh, first start out and just um, mention that um, I think there is a um, uh, difference between being connected and being around other people. Um, and I think sometimes what we do is we we try to make a connection that, uh, you know, by being around other people, I'm going to feel connected. Um, feeling connected with others doesn't have to do with being physically around them. There are many people, and I'm sure you've been in many gatherings where there's a ton of people around you, and um, you know you realize that uh, you're not very feeling very connected with each other. So, um, but one thing that this person mentioned, which uh, they started out with when they said, I, "I have always struggled with it." So, I actually, as a psychologist, would want to know why the person has always struggled with it, mm -hmm. um, because there may be other reasons that are causing that lack of connection that they're feeling, um, and if that other reason isn't dealt with, then it doesn't matter whether we had this epidemic or pandemic or not, um, you know, we would, this person might still feel disconnected and then even if they had access to all the friends around them. Um, but like Dr. Yasmin said, I would uh, try to utilize all the venues and also use this time to figure out why that disconnect uh, exists. Yeah. Sister Fatima, would you like to go ahead and give a little bit of a religious aspect to it as well? Naham, salamu alaikum. Um, billahi min shaitan rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In such a situation, feeling lonely. Sometime in this life, um, it's true we feel lonely. We feel neglected by our family. Life is not fair. But the best thing is we have to find happiness within us. How do we find happiness? We turn to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Ta ala. And how do we do that? Find a book, find a religious book. It can be the Quran. The Quran is very relaxing. 
we can read the Quran, read the books, um, inspiring books of the prophets, or read any other storybooks. And if we cannot do that, find you a very nice movie that is very relaxing. That will calm you down. Yes. Uh, Kanan or Chris, would you like to give uh, some more insight just from the college student perspective? I think um, it was interesting because it was already mentioned that like there's, it's really important to kind of define what being alone is and that that doesn't always mean or is related to being physically around other people, um, especially because all of us, I know I could speak for Hanan as well and he can also jump in, but we both go to UIC. Um, we're both very much a part of the Muslim community there and alhamdulillah, um, there are a lot of Muslims at UIC, right? And so that means that we're always surrounded by a lot of people and I think a lot of times that we, we think that that means that we're not alone um, and that we're always surrounded. And so now that we're at home, um, we're surrounded, but it's by the same smaller group of people, right? Um, and so again, like, I think it's important to try to make those connections that aren't just being, that aren't just because you're next to someone or talking to them face to face, they can really be built um, in, in many other ways. I know my friends and I, we do, like nightly or almost every day we'll do like um, a face or like a FaceTime in a group. So that means we have like 10 of us all. And at the very least we get to see each other's faces and that does bring, bring some ease and some relaxation um, after like a long day. Mm -hmm. And just to add on to that, um, for me, uh, I know since uh, I also go to UIC, the day when I first found out how severe the virus actually is, uh, it was a Friday, and had I known that that week was going to be the last time I saw my friends in person, I probably would have spent a little bit more time with them, because coming back home and hearing on the news that um, where there's all this like uh, panic going on, um, it kind of took like a like a, a huge mental toll on my uh, I guess like also social lifestyle, um, and in general like not being able to see your friends, not being able to go outside especially when you're really active in the community or when your one way to get away from everything is seeing your friends. So cutting that off kind of created like a bridge of like sadness. Um, and that's just like how I felt originally when uh, I first heard about the news. Okay, thank you all so much for that. Uh, I think we can go ahead and move on to our next scenario, uh, which kind of tackles uh, more anxiety versus stress. And again, I'll go ahead and read the scenario and you all can go ahead and respond. Um, so, before I left home for college, there were times where I felt hopeless and I didn't want to get out of bed. I was happier at school, hanging out with my friends. Being away from my home was my way of dealing with all of the stress. Now with the pandemic going on, I am back to square one. I don't really get along with anyone at home. At times, I have questioned my existence in life. Was I a burden to them now that I'm stuck at home? Was I even worth having around to begin with? And I think uh, the scenario we can uh, give to Dr. Fahad first to go ahead and talk about. Um, yeah, sure. So I think uh, I wanna talk about anxiety versus stress first. And um, we have to recognize that some level of stress is actually good and it's healthy and it's normal, right? So all of us, um, you know, if we were to like, visualize it and, and pretend it's like this thermometer from zero to 100 would probably feel a certain level of stress all the time and we need that to keep going um what happens is that when that stress gets out of hand when it turns into anxiety and it's clinical anxiety that's when it becomes problematic so mm -hmm. i think that people whenever they hear the word stress and they hear the word um you know anxiety people start to panic um i don't think anxiety is all that bad i mean i'm feeling anxiety right now as i'm presenting and if I wasn't feeling that, I would probably be doing things that, you know, wasn't, uh, wasn't productive. Um, and so keeping that in mind, um, I want to, uh, you know, these scenarios are bringing in, again, things that are happening in the background. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention even in the last scenario was that uh, it's a good time for us to connect with our family members. If this person felt that they were burdened to their family members, if they never connected with them, um, you see, social connection, you know, it goes both ways, right? So if 
I can't connect with my parents, then I have to also find out what can I do more to connect with them. And now that I'm stuck at home with them, this is the best time to figure that out. So I would um, strongly urge that um, you know people around us that that are there to be calling. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Sorry, no, it's okay. It happens. <laughs> apologize. No, no, it's fine. It brings normalcy to the discussion. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's a good time to connect with people uh, around you so that you don't feel that kind of, because eventually you have to connect with your family of origin. I mean, how long can we avoid our family members? We go to college and I went to college and I came back home. And so, you know, eventually you have to find that like connection that you should have initially with your parents with your spouse, with your kids. I think now is the best time to do that. So that's what I wanted to say. Yeah. Dr. Yasmin, would you like to uh, carry on with that? Yeah, that's a very important point. I, the, the differentiation between stress and anxiety because stress is outside of you and anxiety is internal and stress needs to be managed. We all need some stress in our lives. We also have anxiety. So these are not bad. Stress and anxiety is not good and bad. What makes, what differentiates is the degree of stress or anxiety, right? So um, stress, the way to manage stress is um, to see uh, what is not in your control and what is in your control. So what are the things we cannot control right now, right? The situation is such there is a lot of stuff that we cannot control. So what choices do we have? We have to accept what we cannot control, but then the very easy formula to figure out what you can control is choice equals control. So figure out what is it that you can control right now, and that's what's uh, going to determine and exercise those choices. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Kanan or Chris, do you want to give, because I know as college students, this is a very relatable scenario for many of us. So if you guys want to go ahead and, and carry on with that. So um, I commute um, and I've commuted all four years from UIC. Um, and so I always joke that my commute is my only alone time and my time to like relax. Um, but because I commute, that that means I see my family every day. Um, I know a lot of other college students experience um, that a bit less. If they're living um, at their university or if they're out of state, that means they see their family less. Um, and even though I see my family every day, um, it is still a huge change to now see them every day, all day. Um, and so it just ends up being a lot of adjustments and I like the comments about how at some point we're going to have to connect with our family. Um, and alhamdulillah, thank God, this past, like this whole break has been pretty good so far. It hasn't been too stressful. Um, but actually today I was cutting my brother's hair earlier um, and it was not going as well as everyone was planning. And so he looks fine now, but that um, ended up being the most stressful um, thing of this whole break, this quarantine that I've had. Um, and so the relaxation that we did earlier really, really brought me down. Um, but it's just like realizing that there will be moments where everyone will be at each other, um, like jumping at each other, maybe yelling or just upset. Um, but it's always good to go back to a more relaxing time. Um, and I apologize and I will apologize to them again after this. And I think that's a lot of what's required to be able to like keep healthy relationships. Yeah. yeah. And Kanan, if you'd like to uh, give a few words as well. Right. So I also commute from UIC. And mm -hmm. one of the biggest things is that, like, my schedule is so hectic as is. Um, I usually wake up around 5 a.m. I'm out of the house at 6, commute an hour and a half to college, get there, and my first class starts right around that time as well, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock. And I usually don't get done until late in the afternoon or even nighttime even. Sometimes usually around seven or eight even. So by the time I get home, like I have no energy to like engage with my family, ask them, hey, how are you doing? What's up? Um, how was your day today? But now since we're all staying at home, it's become a lot easier to connect with them um, since we're pretty just jam-packed in one house again. Um, 
and me myself i have a big family um i have six siblings so it's pretty crazy at home like mashallah <laughs> mashallah and it's uh it's always lively and it's good to connect with these people um your own family because when you're at the academic semester you don't get to bond with them as much so i guess like that stress has kind of calmed down a little bit but now it's been uh replaced with like reassurance that at the end of the day family has your back you are with your loved ones and i think that's to me the most like beautiful thing ever sister fatima would you like to uh give any insight as well from the religious perspective Yes, alhamdulillah, with such a situation, there is nothing we can do. Sometimes we are in a situ um, stressful and anxiety situation that not even family can help us. Because family, they will console us, trying to talk us through. But the best thing to do in this kind of situation is to tend to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is nobody who can help you except Allah. An example is the story of Prophet Yunus alayhi salatu wasalam who when he was in a situation, not nobody can help him, not his people, not the nation, except Allah. He was in the stomach of a fish and everything was dark. He couldn't see anything, but he remembered someone, which is Allah. So he remembered to say, la ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu mina zolimin. So sometimes family cannot help us, no friends, nothing. So the best thing is it depends on the level of our belief is to turn to Allah Say istighfar, whatever you know, even saying la ilaha illallah, Allah will send his mercy on you. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, and I think we can go ahead and move on to our final scenario. Um, again, I'm going to read the question uh, and then direct it. Uh, I work at a high end hotel in downtown Chicago. One week ago, I was laid off. I have no clue how I am going to provide for my wife and four kids. My wife and I always end up getting into arguments during times of financial struggle. It has gotten very heated in the past. How can I make sure I take control of the situation from a family standpoint? And again, this can go either to Dr. Yasmin or Dr. Fahad. Hi, Dr. Yasmin. Do you want to start or? No, no, go ahead. You have more experience working with families. So. <laughs> so this is, again, this is a very good example of stress because we have been talking about stress versus anxiety. So, of course, this is real financial stress. This is something that you can put your finger on and say, oh, this is uh, actually what is happening. He is concerned about his financing. Um, and uh, uh, also that he's home with his wife. So of course, that's what's, that's where it's gonna, they're both very anxious and very stressed out. So it comes out uh, to each, uh, with each other. And he has some very specific real concerns about how he's going to provide. He's thinking of the future. And when he starts worrying about the future, it becomes anxiety because that's fear. Anxiety is fear and stress is something which is concrete, which is something outside of yourself. So again, asking yourself this question, what I cannot control and what choices do I have? Uh, Sister Fatima brought up some very important points, like one of the ways to deal with it is if you're spiritual, you know, you turn to Allah and again, accepting uh, what, uh, what the situation is, but then the, ask yourself this question, what choices do I have? And which choices am I willing to exercise? Yeah, so I'm going to just uh, continue on with the point that she just made in the end, um, especially with the, uh, when it comes to, you know, we have to kind of take a step back and look at what is our purpose in life mm -hmm. and what is this life meant to be? So, yeah. you know, if we look at uh, uh, from, from an Islamic perspective, this is meant to be a temporary life. There, I think this is a really good time for us to really, get down to our basic creed and aqidah and recognize uh, who we are and what our purpose is supposed to be. Um, so what I mean by that is, for example, we know that Allah is the one that provides risk. And now, you know, of course, I can't empathize with a person who worked in a, in, in a position where now they can't continue their work from home. Um, but at the end of the day, I think the, the thought that how will I provide for my family? What if this happens? These are very real thoughts that a lot of people are having. 
but it's Allah who provides for that. If we're mm-hmm. stuck at home, our Prophet said that, you know, uh, the example of the dunya is like um, a dunya sijin al mu'min. It's meant to be a prison for the believer. Uh, so we kind of feel like we're in a prison because we're stuck, we're confined to a space. We can't go out, we can't talk to other people. Um, so it's a really good time to go back to the, the, the basics and take a step back and recognize what this world is meant to be. Um, and also recognize that sometimes when we're going through trials and tribulations, that we feel like there's um, we don't have any control, like Dr. Yasmin was saying, um, and we feel like this might last forever, and we feel like we'll, we'll never get out of it. Uh, and most of us who've struggled in the past, we know that once you get out of it, you look back and sometimes you smile and laugh at the, the time that you went through because you come out of it as a much, much stronger person. Um, and so maybe that this is the time that's meant for us. Somebody who has, God forbid, cancer and is going through chemotherapy and is struggling and suffering, um, they won't be able to feel how they will feel, you know, after they've gone through treatment successfully and have come out stronger. Just like we can't feel right now, how we can't imagine how we're going to feel in the hereafter when we get rewarded for all of the struggles that we're going through right now. So I think it's a good time for us to really um, you know, reprioritize ourselves and, and, and look at the bigger picture. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Um, Chris, would yeah. you go ahead? Yeah, um, I'm really glad that the scenario was included only because it's focusing more on low income families. And so I think that um, there's a stereotype uh, with the Muslim community um, and a lot of specific immigrant communities, but that we're all doctors, lawyers, engineers, and alhamdulillah, we have a good amount of people that are in those fields, um, but our community here in the U.S. specifically is very, very diverse, and this is something that a lot of us don't realize, but um, about 33%, which is one in every three Muslims in the U.S., is at or below the poverty line. Um, And for those that know more about economics, even the poverty line is very low when it goes down to numbers and cost of living, of groceries, families, um, education. But that means that although we are all being impacted um, greatly, um, even those that are plus to be in the middle or um, upper middle class, um, they might be experiencing lower wages or temporarily out of work um, and might be experiencing those stresses. But a lot of our families have been experiencing that for decades. Um, and this is only becoming even more dire for them and um, the situations that they're experiencing. So I think something that we should think about is if we're in a spot where, alhamdulillah, we have some savings or we're able to remotely um, work and work from home um, and still have a stable income, then reaching out to our neighbors, really, and seeing how they're doing, if they need groceries for example which it would be the simplest thing but they might not be experiencing the same um the same thing we are and so i think that's really important um i know the question also talks about um some like heated uh family situations and those struggles so i know we haven't talked about those and that's totally not my expertise so i just wanted to mention that because i think that would be something that we could also continue discussing for a bit and what do you call just being college students in general um, I think it's most difficult and impactful towards us, like our generation, um, because the increase in unemployment is causing most people to panic in terms of um, financial distress, which is major because um, how are they going to pay for their tuition, uh, their college fees, if on campus jobs, which was their only way of making money, um, is no longer there for them, right? So alhamdulillah, being able to like work from home is such a blessing. Um, but then what about the people who don't have that, um, you know, privilege? What about the people who also are, they come home to a uh, family setting where because of these financial distress, uh, they, it, it, it leads to more domestic violence um, and it just adds to the more frustration. What about those people? So in terms of like community and how that reacts, um, so I want to like bounce back to uh, Dr. Fahad Han. Um, what would you tell to a family who experiences like domestic violence and comes to you for like help um, in terms of like financial distress? Like how, how can we, you know, seek help in that term? Um, so, you know, I've, we've had a lot of families uh, to Khalil Center, referred to Khalil Center for these kind of issues. 
Um, I think a lot of times when you see domestic violence, it, it has a lot to do with, again, I, I'm, I was thinking as a psychologist, it has a lot to do with a lot of factors that happened before. Sometimes these are like learned behaviors that we grew up with in our own families. Um, sometimes it's a cultural or even like a, a gender kind of expectation, you know, to be uh, strong and overpowering sometimes. And I think those factors need to be taken into consideration. Now, whatever causes the stress, whether it's staying at home for, because of coronavirus or financial stress or, you know, in-laws or any of the, the common stressors that cause problem in marriage is going to bring that out more, right? So we have to work on the original problem and why that exists. And again, I would say that somebody mentioned earlier about suicide and, you know, if, if anybody needs help, please reach out. You know, there's hotlines that are available 24 hours. Khalil Center has a chat online and, and you know, we, we offer web therapy. Reach out to somebody because if you're at a point where you're feeling extreme anger, where you want to hit somebody, or if you're feeling so depressed and hopeless that you're going to, you know, you want to hurt or kill yourself, uh, that's not a time that where you're going to be able to help yourself as much and you might need somebody else to get you through that time. Um, and if you work with a psychologist, if you came to my office, I would probably look at some of the earlier things that we just talked about, like, what is it that makes you want to do that? And where did you learn that from? And how can we better um, deal and cope with that um, so that it doesn't happen, you know, whether you're at work or you're at home, you're dealing with your kids or you're dealing with your spouse? Would anyone else like to uh, discuss anything relating to this scenario? Okay. Um, there was one question that came in in regards to um, scenario number two, and I think it would be really great to just tie in here really quick. Um, this is from Jamal Baki. Um, he says that I can relate to this question from a different perspective. Productivity has been something that keeps me distanced from stress and anxiety. Mm -hmm. Being at home a lot more has decreased that productivity. How can we mimic that busy life at home to keep our minds off of stresses and just feeling better overall? Um, and I'm not sure who would like to take this question first, but you can go ahead. Um, can I start? Yeah. Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, this is a new normal for us. And it is a very unique situation because we are under this uh, tremendous stress and we are separated from each other and we have to uh, we are alone and uh, but what makes it unique is that the whole world is doing this together so having said that uh, because it is a very unique situation when we don't really have any examples of how people have dealt with it it is very easy to lose the routines and to start feeling unproductive so what I'm telling my clients over and over again is please get into some kind of routines, some kind of rituals, so that you can still um, continue a degree of normalcy in this unusual situation. So having a routine for sleep, for exercise, for waking up, for showering, getting ready, getting so that you have something to look forward to. If you have nothing to look forward to, you would not want to get out of bed. Yeah. yeah, so I I'm going to mention, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. And I was going to say there's two, there's, there are two principles that I want to mention here. Um, I, one important one, which for Muslims is very important, is to have balance in our lives. Mm -hmm. um, we have to have balance and we have to have structure with time and place. So what do I mean by that? And what I've been recommending, what I've been trying to do myself is to have a uh, structured schedule. So you know, um, if I worked from my normal working hours were from like 11 to 6, I'm maintaining the same working hours. Yes. My kids upstairs don't know that I'm actually not in the house. They think I'm actually in my office right now. Uh, and I sneak out and come back into the basement um, because I want that to be the case. Um, so time, we have to manage accordingly. Mm -hmm. We have to wake up at a certain time. We have to go to sleep at a certain time. We have to eat at a certain time. That has to be balanced. The other thing is place. So if you have a room in your house, if you have the freedom to have the room, uh, make that your working space and don't make sure you don't do anything else in there. Mm -hmm. Every space has its own specific purpose. Mm -hmm. Just like we're not supposed to be using our phones in the bathroom. We're not supposed to be doing our homeworks on our dining table. We're not supposed to be eating on our beds. So uh, designate a specific place. And if you don't have an extra room, even within your own house, a corner that's for exercising, a corner that's for 
you know, being productive, a corner where you're going to go for relaxation and make sure you follow that strictly because what's going to begin to happen as time moves forward is that all of these, our body has a memory, you know, it it remembers certain things. When you go to a certain place, uh, it goes into a certain mode. And if we don't have those specific designations, it's going to get mixed up and uh, you're going to be, you know, in your office, but you won't feel productive. You're going to be in your bed, but you won't feel sleepy. You'll be on the dining table, but you won't feel hungry. So please keep that in mind um, and, and again, balance it all. Yeah. I mean, what I was going to say was, subhanAllah, I was actually going to mention a few, like something similar, but this idea that um, we think that we always have to be doing work to be productive and to be doing good. But um, like, for example, I have a more, I have, still have work. Um, I still have school that I'm doing, but I do have more free time now because I'm not commuting back and forth. And so the idea is, if I want to feel productive, I can totally fill that spot up, but it doesn't have to be work. Like it doesn't have to be schoolwork if I'm already getting that done. Um, I think what I've started getting into now has been yoga. Um, And there are a lot of other like things, my family, every other night we do game night, which sometimes does cause a bit more stress because we're all like, we're all super competitive, but that's keeping us away from our screen especially now that like I'm looking at my screen more to do my online classes, to do um, I tutor online remotely. So this idea of like still filling in the gaps so that we don't have too much time to just sit and stare at our phones and go through Mm -hmm. social media. Um, But we don't have to fill it up with what we're used to. We don't have to be run, 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 go, go, go. Um, We just have to make sure that we have stuff to do, like what's being said to look forward to and, to keep us on a schedule so that we're not waking up at 2 p.m. Um, I know I can speak for that um, on my own experience of last week, but not waking up at 2 p.m. and then staying up until like 4 a.m. Um, mm-hmm. just to keep like a good routine. Because inshallah, we, um, God willing, we will get to a point where we're going to go back into our normal lives. And mm-hmm. so we want to have a consistent routine to, to keep us going. Um, add one more point to that. Uh, these are s- such important points. Uh, sorry, I hope I'm not interrupting anyone. Okay, sure. remember we are human beings, not human doings. And we believe as Muslims that everything happens for a reason. So uh, perhaps this is Allah's plan, like Dr. Fahad was talking about, to that we need to slow down in this very, very fast paced lives that we are giving. And how are we going to use this time? We can evolve. So there is a difference between just changing and evolving. So we are slowing down, reflecting and thinking and figuring out. It's a very humbling experience for me personally. Uh, because I get a chance to figure out what is really important, who is really important, and what really matters. Thank you. Okay, so um, is there anything else anyone else would like to say? What I wanted to say is this is uh, a great opportunity. In every bad, there is good as a believer, and we should realize that this is automatic vacation that Allah has given us, whether we like it or not. Some people never take vacation in their life. They go, 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 that's all they do. And this is an advantage for um, parents to be with their kids. Some kids never see their father or mother because they are always working. By the time they get up, mom went to work. By the time they come home, they sleep. So this is the time the family came together. So this is a blessing from Allah that we should accept. Whatever happens, there is rahma, And in this bad condition, there is good. Some people have prayed for this, and Allah has granted it for them. Alhamdulillah. And it kind of goes to the concept of like reconnecting with your family, like centering yourself around that, um, you know, just that environment, that atmosphere. You know, just reconnecting with your loved ones. And that's, mashallah, so that really like, good point that you just made. Thank you so much. Um, we are going to go ahead and move on to our questions, but there were a few more that came in. Um, so before we jump into our questions, I'll just be asking one more, uh, and then we can continue on, inshallah. Um, so one of our uh, 
attendees says that they're a, they're a single and living with their roommate, a good friend. Uh, we are now holed up in our apartment. I'm scared. I don't want to go to my parents or grandparents' home. I don't really want to deal with the craziness of the world. What is mentally healthy right now? Um, wh who would like to take this first? I think I, I think we've, we've kind of already covered uh, a little bit yeah. of like how to stay mentally healthy. Um, okay. I will say that I know it's difficult and it's probably not safe to go visit your grandparents, uh, especially because you might be a carrier uh, asymptomatic and you might end up, you know, um, causing them some pain. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely use this time to connect uh, electronically, FaceTime, um, you know, whatever you can do. Um, but maintaining a schedule uh, is going to be, I think, extremely important. And one more thing, I think people think that we can't go outside. You can go outside, you just can't be around people. So go out for a walk, you know, go out for a run, whatever you have to do. Um, just don't go around people. That's the only thing here. Um, uh, I don't think the virus stays airborne for like, you know, longer than some time that it's going to affect you that if you're walking around your neighborhood and somebody had it, then, you know, you're going to catch it. Um, so definitely go out for a walk, uh, go out, uh, you know, um, uh, with the, if you're living with your roommate, you might as well go out with your roommate because you, the two of you probably already, you know, uh, there's no there's no other extra risk involved there. Mm -hmm. um, but the question you have on here uh, is different. So I, want, I don't yeah. know which one were you referring to. So yeah, that was just a question that we had uh, from from our uh, open chat forum. Uh, but okay. I think we can go ahead and move on to our first question uh, that's preset. Um, so what do you think that the effect of COVID-19 will be on your mental health, the people around you, and your community? Um, can I go? Uh, yeah, you can. Okay. Um, Allah min shaitan rajim. Bismillah rahman rahim. We should, as a believer, we should believe that uh, this is uh, the signs of the last days. This is a test from Allah. As he said in the Quran that, we shall test you with calamities, um, with something of fear, hunger, loss of lives and fruit, but give glad tidings to patients. And who among us, when afflicted with uh, calamity, would truly say to Allah we belong and to him we shall return. We are in this situation, everybody is stressful and it's overwhelming with the news, the environment, some people catch you, we don't know who catch and who don't, and we are scared to even get closer to families. Now, when you see a family, you can shake the iron. When they sneeze, you run away. This is the situation we are in. The, the thing I suggest is um, helping one another, calling each other and keeping ourselves. For me, I keep myself very busy so that at the end of the day, I don't really have to think about it. And I follow the standard precaution what they say, do this, do that, so you don't get the virus and just stay calm. That's what we can do. Thank you, Sister Fatima. Uh, would anyone else like to take this away? I would say uh, the holistic approach, mind, body, and spirit. Taking care of your body, your mind, and your spiritual side. Uh, so some of of the things we can do to take care of our bodies is to maintain proper nutrition, exercise. Dr. Fahad was talking about walking outside. These, these things are very important to keep your body moving because what happens with stress is that we tighten up our bodies consciously, uh, unconsciously. You see, there is this whole theory about body keeps a score. So that's what trauma and stress does to us. And sometimes these experiences in our bodies stay. So keep your body moving, uh, feed yourself properly, proper sleep. And that would happen with routines. Now, what can you do for your mind? Uh, you know, routines, productivity, also uh, exercises, uh, special wellness activities. Somebody talked about yoga. We did some meditation. You could, whatever works for you, Tai Chi, things like that. And other than that, the social piece, the social part would be social engagement, the connectivity, not superficial connectivity, perhaps because we have more time right now. So we have time for deeper connectivities, even with our parents or people we haven't met for a long time and the spiritual side, uh, connectivity to God. And we have more time now and let's see how 
we are utilizing that time and really slowing down. I wanted to say something uh, in regards to the aspect of community. And mm -hmm. it kind of goes into like qualities and traits such as like being kind, showing mm -hmm. compassion, empathy towards like your loved ones, your friends, your family, mm -hmm. and being a part of like so many different organizations and like the aspect of community, right? Um, just being centered around that aspect and just checking up on your friends. Because if one is like, if someone is going through um, like a difficult time at their home or even the work environment, just reassuring them that, hey, at the end of the day, surely after every difficulty comes ease, mm -hmm. just as after every night comes day, right? Like just that, the saying that will be so helpful in calming them down and reassuring them that in these times of like difficulty, things will get better. And you will come out of this a stronger and better person. And I think like the best advice that I could give like to the community itself is just check up on your loved ones, right? Just mm -hmm. be kind to one another. Um, because when we're practicing physical distancing, we tend to get like irritated um, or a bit agitated um, with our peers. Like, um, why isn't this happening? Or how come this event in my life didn't play out the way I wanted it to? You know, just understanding that, you know, Alhamdulillah, always. Just be grateful and understand there's a hidden blessing in something and that you'll come up stronger at the other end. So just like reassurance aspect in the community um, is something we should all just like be um, promoting. Um, and I just wanted to emphasize that from like a community aspect. Yeah, um, along with community, I think, and this is something that a lot of people are like from the very beginning were immediately very concerned about and it's uh, Ramadan, right? And how, especially now that we're seeing how long the stay at home orders will be in place and possibly even longer than that, um, it will on, obviously affect the way that all of us experience Ramadan. Um, may Allah allow us all to see it. Um, but basically, it, I think it's a good lesson to realize that although, and I could speak for, I've been Muslim for um, a year now, Alhamdulillah, but um, I mean, my experience, and I can say for a lot of the youth, our Ramadan consists of us looking forward to our if an iftar that we're going to have with our group of friends um, or staying up all night, sleeping over at a friend's or whatever it ends up being. Um, but I think it's so important to go back and realize that our experience in Ramadan should really start and end with family. And so Alhamdulillah, we'll kind of be forced um, to experience all of Ramadan in the best of ways, but with our family um, and really focusing on how we treat them and um, being grateful for all the little moments during the whole blessed month um, before going out um, after. But I think that's one thing that like we think because we're not gonna be experiencing Sadawi and a lot of other bigger community things that we'll miss out on all the blessings. But um, I mean, again, all the blessings will start and end with our, with our own family and with ourselves and how we go ahead and make the most out of Ramadan. And I know Sister Fatima could obviously add more to that, but that was just my thing that I was thinking because it will be my, like my second Ramadan. And the last one was great, Alhamdulillah, uh, because I got to see friends all the time and be around um, all these Muslims. But now, Alhamdulillah, it'll be just with my family. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Chris, on that note, actually, we did have a question come in regarding Ramadan. And um, basically they were asking how they can approach Ramadan, uh, being used to like the community with social and religious obligations and um, how to prepare for Ramadan. So were there any specific um, ways that you are going to be preparing for this Ramadan given that physical distancing? And of course, you know, Chris, you can talk about this, Sister Fatima as well. Yeah, I mean, I already spoke a bit about it. I mean, yeah. personally, I've just been like taking advantage of my free time and listening to more lectures than I usually do um, to kind of begin to ease into like the spiritual high that we all experience. Um, but yeah, that's what I've personally been doing. Um, but yeah, I think this one for sure, Sister Fatima could, could take it away. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Um, with Ramadan, we pray to Allah that everything comes down before Ramadan that we are able to come together as one. And it says, um, it is up to Allah if you want to make me, you, and the whole nation one. It is up to him. 
So we have to believe, think positive that things will be okay. This is just temporal and it's not permanent. Everything will resolve. But um, allow Alam, in case this doesn't happen, we can do video calling and zooming each other when it's time for um, iftar, praying together. These are some of the connections that can help the community. Because if we're still in such a situation, there is a reason for that. Maybe Allah wants us to come and repent, tend to him, do istighfar. There is something going on that we don't know. Allah only uses a virus to test us. So this is the best time. If you don't want us to come together during Ramadan, you want everybody to be in isolation, then this is the time we should all relax and do istighfar and ask for his mercy, his guidance, and his protection. And we can Zoom each other when it's time for iftar, when it's time for prayer, and we can all eat together being on Zooming. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we can go ahead and move on to our next question, inshallah. And um, this is, what is the best way we can be mindful of our own emotional state? How can we support ourselves and support each other? Um, and I really wanted to direct this to Sister Fatima as well, because um, it discusses being mindful of your emotional state and supporting each other. So if you'd like to start. Yeah, Alhamdulillah. I always say Alhamdulillah for everything. And at this time is to support one another. Mm -hmm. Um, is to encourage people to talk about it, what is bothering them, so that they will be free from what is in, on their chest and in their mind. And ask for their help, ask them, do you need my help at this moment? What do you want me to do? And if they, they don't need your help, whatever need that they need, you can refer them to whoever can help them. And tell them at this moment, especially also helping the elderly, these elderly people, they are so helpless. There is nothing they can do. This is the best time to call the elderly people, assure them that everything will become, what do they need? This is the best time yeah. to do that. When, when it comes to, um, come to terms with what you're, how are you feeling, um, how your day has been going, I would say even from like a, like a religious aspect when you're praying like salah and when you're done and you're making that dua take an extra minute you know take just that one extra minute to make a longer dua to self-reflect and see like what you're grateful with alhamdulillah like all the blessings that you've been blessed with today you're able to you're healthy you're living under a roof you have a family you have friends and just like self-reflecting in that sense when you are closest to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will really help you like be aware of like your emotional state but then also setting aside like a designated time. Um, so I know like for me, I try to make sure at least for like an hour or even two every single day, like I'll read um, like a poetry book or an excerpt from a novel or I'll paint a picture. Like these are things that I use to get away from the world when I'm stressed, right? So like poetry and art, um, try that. Like I guess using a creative outlet or any other outlets to distract you in the moment um, can also like be really reflective of what you're feeling. Um, I guess like paint a picture of what you're feeling in that moment or how are things going on in your situation um, or even like the best approach, paint a landscape painting like Bob Ross. I mean, I always enjoy those. Um, so those are just some things that I usually do uh, when I wanna like self-reflect or just be mindful of like how I am in that time. Um, and how I can ask for help if I need it. And when it comes to like supporting ourselves and each other, again, with that aspect of like just checking up with each other, like don't wait for someone to like message you first or like call you, like be that person who initiates that conversation to check up on each other. And inshallah, like it'll be most beneficial for all of us. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Yasmin or Dr. Fahad, would you also like to say something? I want to talk a bit about, about emotions um, because, you know, I think we have to recognize that it's a normal human tendency in our, our default sometimes is to uh, pick out the negative emotions, to the, pick out the negative aspects of something. And that's why people remember uh, negative memories more than the positive memories. Uh, if I showed you a piece of paper with a black dot, you'd probably see the black dot. 
So um, I think we have to put an extra effort in recognizing the positive emotions, the positive memories, um, especially uh, throughout the day. So, you know, there's a lot of research on gratitude and how that can help people with their emotions um, and make them feel better. Someone asked a question earlier about, um, you know, uh, uh, people who are having uh, children right now and, you know, they're like first time mothers or, or parents. Um, I think we, if you look at the positive end of that, it's, it's, it's probably the really good thing that the child is going to grow up in a house where both parents are there all the time. And it's an environment where everyone's participating and they're growing together. Um, so there is a, always a positive uh, aspect to anything that apparently seems to be negative. Um, there's a really good lecture by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf that um, talks about benefits of trials and tribulations. And it's based off of a book by another um, scholar in the past. So I urge you to listen to that because it's about reframing when something negative is happening to you into something that's positive. So um, there's a saying, life is not what happens to you. Life is what you think happens to you. So thank you uh, so much, Dr. Fahad, for bringing that up about reframing. And a lot of you are talking about gratitude. So there are two concepts in Islam that are so, uh, so important, sabr and shukr. And psychology talks about it. Research has proven that. So sabr is the acceptance, right? But not a passive acceptance, but it's also like determination. So, and that is a prerequisite for gratitude, which in Islam is shukr. So they go hand in hand. And a lot of you guys are talking about uh, shukr and gratitude. And there has been a lot of research done on gratitude. Like one of the ways I am coping with it and I'm telling my clients is that, you know what, every day make a list of three things that you're grateful for, three different things each day. And you will be amazed uh, how long this list goes. Yeah, I did that. That's actually really cool that you mentioned that. I know my friends and I do that three list thing. Mm -hmm. um, frequently and it, uh, it does put a lot of things into perspective. Yes. One other thing that I have done is after I put the three things that I'm grateful for for the day, and they could be as big as being alive and health yes. to as simple as saying, oh, I woke up early or I got to sleep in today, for example, right? Like mm -hmm. they, they always vary um, and it's always nice to do them at the end of the day, but I also add three things that I spent the most time doing. Mm -hmm. um, and whether that was mentally or physically, but I write those down and that automatically puts me in the situation where I'm reflecting on what I'm using my time for. And then after a bit, I can go back and read it. And I, I put it in my notes on my phone mm -hmm. so it's easy to access, but I can go back and go, hmm, I spend a lot of time doing this. Do I really need that much time? Or, hey, I realize that I don't mention this at all, right? Like this one thing that I've always wanted to do. Uh, I think that's another cool thing to add to like, the three things that you're grateful for. And then after you get used to writing the three things, um, then going to like also writing three things that you did the most or spent the most time. Um, mm -hmm. And again, I think it's important to like, mm -hmm. not even physical, but sometimes it's like, oh, I stressed about this all day, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm gonna write that down. Or mm -hmm. I was happy about this all day, so I'm gonna write that down. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that's just something that, that, that and, seems to work. So you're talking about then oh. when you write it down, then you evaluate if it was worth mm -hmm. it. Right. So yeah, that, exactly. that is that is about balancing. You're always mm. thinking about how you're balancing your life. So that's a very good example. And Sister Fatima talked about helping others. And actually, research is showing that helping others, taking doing uh, good deeds uh, is actually releases happy hormones in the body and in the brain. So we actually get happiness hormones and we feel genuinely happy taking care of others. So this is a wonderful opportunity to be of service to others. Right, and adding to that, uh, the three daily um, bullets and points of like what you're grateful of, like even if you were to write that down in like a journal and yeah. you just kept like a daily like, like journal entry of like, okay, today I'm like grateful that I have my friends. Today I'm grateful that I have food on the table and then I'm grateful that I was able to pray for law and time. And then mm -hmm. next day, do it again. And then that'd be like a journal entry, like yeah. you do repetitively, yes. put you in that motion and that rhythm so that you can also reflect and like see what you're doing differently because it's better to count your blessings than count the negativity 
in your life, right? Yeah. So it's it's alhamdulillah. Yeah, it's funny because um, Hanan and I are in a group of friends and we do this the journal thing. That's why right now that you mentioned it, it's really funny. <laughs> and so both of us know what we're talking about, but we do it as a group. One of our friends started like bringing in a journal and we'd pass it around the table every day. We'd see each other during our free time and we'd write it down. And then at the end, read them out loud and kind of reflect. And then all of us would write, alhamdulillah, like thank God at the end of each thing we were grateful for. Some in Arabic, some in like English transliteration. Um, but that we kind of put each other in check too. So mm -hmm. I think because now we're at home, maybe starting one with your family, for example, or your siblings. And then mm -hmm. that way you're able to also see what they're grateful because that mm -hmm. does bring new perspective if you go, oh, well, I also have that, but I didn't really think mm -hmm. about it like that. But now that you're saying that you're grateful for it, it's one of your three things, then I, I should really appreciate it more too. Um, that's just like a, like a cool thing, yeah. And when you do that, you tend to just like be in a more calm and relaxed state of mind because you're counting your blessings and not your hardships. And that changes the perspective of a lot of things. Like we hear that metaphor, like glass half full versus half empty, right? So just thinking about like how you can look on the brighter side of things. So at the end of the day, just say Alhamdulillah always. So there is this thing in the, when you focus on something, you amplify. So think right. about it. So when you're focusing on something negative, you're going to amplify that experience. When you're focusing on something positive, you're going to amplify that. That's why when we are doing this meditation, we are focusing on the breath. And what does that do? You, your body starts relaxing because you are I think she froze up. Yeah, I think. Wait, did I freeze up or did Dr. Yusuf freeze no, up? Oh, yeah. Yeah, can you just repeat that last part, Dr. Yusuf? <laughs> yeah. It was about, you cut off a relaxation. Oh, did I freeze up? You did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, when did I freeze up? <laughs> at, at relaxation. So I said when we were doing a relaxation exercise and we are focusing on our breath, what happens? What happens is that we amplify that experience of the breath and we focus on it and our body begins to relax and your breath begins to start changing. Yeah. And right. you, mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Yasmin. Um, I think we're ready to move on to our next question. Did anyone have anything else they wanted to add? Okay. Um, uh, somebody already talked about it, but just to put it into one sentence, uh, start writing in a journal. I think a lot of people don't do journaling. Mm. I think it's a really good time to to start doing that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And also, I, I can also just add something to it. Also, this is the best time, especially for the kids to memorize the Quran. Because <laughs> yeah. I have a student who, within two weeks, they are home doing their homework. They were able to memorize like um, seven surahs. Oh, 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 oh. Not just kids, everybody, right? What about us? <laughs> yeah, you're never too old. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and move on to question three. Um, and this I'm going to direct Kanan first. Um, I'm scared of this pandemic ruining my future. What are some positive things that I can take from this time? And what can we take from this time to better our lives? Kanan, if you want to go ahead. Um. <laughs> to me, this hits so home with me because um, just a little bit of background. I am a third year neuroscience major um, on the pre-med track. So with this whole like crisis going on, it's scary because I was supposed to be taking my MCAT like now, but it got postponed. I need to get into research, need to do all these things and start applying to medical schools. And I know I can speak on like behalf of like other undergraduates who are pursuing the same track and other professions such as pre-law, pre-health, who are either transitioning from high school level to university level or from university to you know, postgraduate or higher education, it's stressful. And we don't know what's gonna happen, but at the end of the day, like I said before, like that reassurance that surely after every difficulty comes ease, just as after every night comes day, that there is light at the end of the tunnel, that you'll, you're going to get through this, and just remind yourself of the, the blessings that you have so you can stay calm and move. Try, try harder and just keep trying. Try your best and then leave the rest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the best that you can do in this time of crisis, right? And 
um, some things that you can do to stay positive is be productive. Um, if you're not um, working on academic, work on community work. It doesn't have to be something you do physically in person. It could even be setting up a like a mini like webinar presentation just like this with your friends or close family and friends um, and just being inclusive in that aspect. Like just get, giving back to the community because what we tend to see nowadays is a lot of knowledge being mishandled, like misinformation being um, just like uh, portrayed or projected on like social media in general, right? And I think the aspect of like worrying about your future um, kind of derives from like this dependency on like news and intel and all of that from um, on like uh, phony like sources. So I would say, and this is what I do, um, I'll usually set times where I'll do my research, um, either it could be through Google News or simply through like Twitter, or that's usually how I get most of my information relayed back to me. Mm -hmm. um, just following sources and taking and staying up to date on the crisis and then helping people stay informed. To me, that's like the best way how I could have planned my future by staying informed. Um, it helps uh, to like release all that stress and anxiety as well. Um, and if you help one another stay informed, it's gonna ultimately um, it's going to be like a good blessing for all of us, inshallah. Inshallah, we can all like take away away from that in our aspect. And I know like Chris as well, he he's uh, pursuing um, postgraduate as well. So I'm going to let him also give a little bit of insight of his perspective from a pre-law aspect, perhaps. Yeah, subhanAllah. Um, and that, like Hanan's answer, especially at the beginning, really highlights like my perspective on this. Um, so he was saying he's pre-med, um, preparing for the MCAT. I'm pre-law preparing for the LSAT. Um, and so it's my last semester. And so everything up to graduation ceremonies have been like postponed. Um, and a lot of my friends were getting ready to graduate and go immediately into their career. Some didn't have a career set, but the idea of having a college degree put them in a place where they were ready to go on the job hunt if they weren't already. Um, and then like for example, me or my younger brother that's in high school, we're looking to like the next level, right? And so applications and like, it always has this super competitive vibe to it. Um, when we think about like what the next step is um, for our futures, um, especially for the youth. But I was saying that it's so great that Hanan mentioned it because then when he says that, it puts me, it puts it into perspective for me where I think and go, wait, I am not the only one being affected. And so far, a lot of the questions we've talked about like on an individual basis and reflecting, but I think another important thing is to reflect on how everyone is being affected. Mm -hmm. So I'm not the only person that's graduating this year from undergrad, um, far from it. I'm also not the only person that's looking at internships, that's looking at jobs, that's looking at the next step. And so it's so important to realize that everyone has been sent home, right? And so everything has been put on halt, especially for, for our age range. But because we're all being affected, we're all kind of being put a step back. And so this idea of um, we don't need, I guess the point is that, yes, we can still be productive with our time. And maybe this time we like built and go back and edit our resumes. Um, and make a LinkedIn account and all these other things that will help us in the future, but to not go crazy thinking that um, everyone is out there getting a job while we're stuck at home, right? Um, we're all stuck at home. Um, and I think that's one of like the really important things to think about when, when we're thinking about um, our future and how this is affecting us. Yeah. Um, what I wanted to add to this is that um, Alhamdulillah, again, with this, for me, what I'll say, I am not scared with the, the pandemic the pandemic ruining my future. Why? Because what is meant for a mankind will come to pass. Whatever is meant for individual will happen. And if this is the way or this is the path you have to go through for you to be a better person, this is what you have to go through. And the positive thing is that through this 
um, pandemic, the nation have come together. There is no separation. We are united. There is unity among us. Right here, we are all on this web trying to help each other, trying to help the nation. And um, people are coming donating food. People are donating blood. Everybody is coming out to do something to help one another. This is what this pandemic had caused us. So we have to be glad that some people are thinking, my own our future. This is what you have to go through in order to become a better person. Maybe you haven't taken you trying to take your exam or whatever you trying to do. Maybe Allah wants you to step back and realize. Step back, take time in whatever you want to do. Who knows? Maybe when it's time for you to go do something, something will happen. So Allah put you back and say, wait. Relax, calm, take time for whatever you want to do so things will be better. So with patience, things will be better. This is not permanent. It's just temporarily, inshallah. 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 Thank you so much. And inshallah, we're all in this together as well. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and move on to question uh, number four. Um, and this is directed to our mental health professionals on the panel. How have you been helping clients deal with the coronavirus? And what advice can you give to help people deal with the isolation? Uh, Dr. Yasmin or Dr. Fahad can go first. So, and the advice that I've given is what I've given here. Uh, having a, a schedule, I ask my clients to write, make a schedule, write it down, post it and then modify it as, as needed. So if something's not working, then change it. Have a schedule where it's more balanced. So you're doing everything that you're supposed to be doing uh, every day, uh, making sure that you're sleeping on time and waking up on time. If you take any healthy person and modify and alter their sleeping schedule, they're gonna go crazy. So, you know, this is not a good time to be playing around with that. So try to go to sleep between 10 and midnight and wake up between eight and, uh, eight and nine, of course, fudger too, but you know, uh, afterwards. Uh, between eight and 10, if you can. Um, the other thing that I'm doing is also asking them to journal. So uh, writing down your thoughts, your emotions, being more specific about your emotions. There are different types of journaling techniques. So, you know, you can have a dear diary journal if, you, if that's what you like. You can have one that just goes through your tasks. You can do something called push, uh, what was it called? Bullet journaling. Um, and then you can do, you can also look up um, writing, um, um, what are they called, uh, prompts, uh, so that they can help you kind of, you know, start you off with, uh, with writing something down. Um, but writing is going to be very important right now. Um, keeping yourself busy and not having a downtime. Uh, and if the downtime is there if for self-reflection, that's different. Um, but having just time when you're just bored, there's so many things you can do. I mean, watching lectures is one thing, but you can go on like EDX or some website and, and Coursera and learn something for free. You can take a Harvard course on computer science for free, and that's going to be something that you, you'll feel happy about and, and feel accomplished about. You can take a course on photography and, and business. So keep yourself busy uh, because the more free time you have, the more time you're giving shaitan to enter into your mind, you know, uh, bombard you with negative thoughts, and then end up having negative emotions and, and, and lead to uh, you know, uh, depression and other problems. Those are very good points, Dr. Fahad, because I was thinking along those lines, I will just add uh, some more to those points. And one is proper nutrition, so that you are building your immune system and you're taking care of your body, uh, spiritual practices, whatever makes sense to you. Uh, so there has been research that, you know, doing Tasbi, you know, just uh, uh, going through the beads, you know, because you're touching it and you're using those words repeatedly, it almost has this calming effect on you, uh, whatever works for you. And some people were talking about uh, stress. The stress threshold is very important. Like everybody is very different. I am very different and how much news I can tolerate in a day. And it keeps changing from day to day. So awareness is very important. Be aware of your own mental state because the mental state is not uh, dormant, it keeps changing, you know, I, you hear some news and you know, you may be uh, getting a little anxious. So be aware, that is very important. And then decide day on a day to day basis, how much information you want, 
how do you want that information? You were talking, Chris, about facts. Yeah, it is very, it is, it is helpful to have the facts. And how you're going to get the facts is your choice. Uh, another thing that I cannot stress enough is uh, um, taking care of your mind, is, uh, mindfulness exercises. Uh, that's why I led this meditation. I cannot stress that enough. There are some very nice free apps out there and you can download them in your phone and use that like Headspace, uh, Calm. Uh, there's another one called Mindful. So those would be very helpful and you can do that on a, on a regular basis. And a lot of them have gone free for the coronavirus pandemic. So a lot of the ones yeah. that you would have to pay before. Yes, yes, there are many free ones out there. Also lots of webinars are are there and they are streaming free. So that's very helpful. Also, uh, also hobbies, sorry. So sorry. No, we're just, we're running a little bit short on time, but we can. Any you... hobbies that you've been putting off, you can take it now. Okay, awesome. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and transition to the next question, inshallah, and this is to our college students. How are you navigating this crisis as a young member of the community? What are you doing to cope with the changes around you, and how are you helping out during this crisis? Um, and Chris, if you would like to go first. Yeah, so um, I'm a member of the MSA at UIC, and so we're continuing to send out emails um, with information on webinars, on lectures, on opportunities to keep students engaged because the school year is still continuing. Um, and then, which we'll talk about at the end, but I, with the coalition, with the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition, I'm also a part in helping with CARE Coalition. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that at the end. But where I'm doing my best to stay as engaged as I usually am um, with helping the community but being smart about it by doing it all virtually in a way where I'm not endangering myself or others. Um, it's a huge adjustment, but obviously very, very necessary. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Kanan, did you have anything you wanted to say? Okay. I think you're on mute, Hanan, if you are trying to say something. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to talk. <laughs> So um, Chris like made a really good point, and we do that from our organization as well, which is PCRF, which stands for Palestine Children's Relief Fund. And um, everything that Chris just said with MSA, we do that with PCRF as well. And different organizations on campus are all, all contributing in the same manner, which I think is really beneficial since everyone's on the same page. So alhamdulillah that we are all like, like the whole network of like people at UIC, like they're all close friends who are also community leaders who are all engaging in the same page and same pathway, which I think really just amplifies everything. So SubhanAllah, that's like really beautiful how like all your friends and all your um, university friends, they're just like working together to one common goal. And the best way or advice that I would give to like people to engage in the community would be to figure out something that you want to engage in as well and pursue that promote pursue that promoting aspect to also like help out in that aspect when it comes to like um, just leadership, take initiative, uh, start something or join an organization to help for like a greater cause. Um, that also kind of goes back into like um, being able to like manage your time. And in a way it puts all the energy into something so that you're just not idle and doing nothing. So. I would say engage into like an organization or a movement that will help you stay busy, stay active, but also help the community in the bigger picture, inshallah. 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 Okay, thank you so much. Um, we are now on our last question for the evening and we're running really short on time here, um, but to our community leaders, how has this specifically affected your community? What words of encouragement can you give to help people process this crisis? And I think, Sister Fatima, if you just want to say a few words on this um, before we close out, inshallah. Yes, um, with my community, the Nigerian Islamic community, is um, we are doing okay, alhamdulillah, for that. And the leaders, we are making sure that um, everybody is spiritually healthy. And what we do, we do most of our meetings online. 
and we do video calls. There are le Friday lectures online. On Sundays, there are lectures. There are two sections, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. Whoever can make uh, in the morning, maybe you cannot make it in the afternoon. And also, we call the elderly to check on them, make sure they are eating healthy, they are safe, and taking their medication. And I usually also call some of the leaders um, for updates in the community. And with the students, what I do, I call them that, um, to make sure that they are on track with their Quranic reading and Islamic studies. And sometimes I gather some of them and we talk, we tell stories, some inspiring stories to let them know what is going on. That's most of the time what we do. Thank you so much, Sister Fatima. Um, okay, everyone, uh, this concludes our uh, webinar for this evening. Um, thank you all so much for being here and joining us. Um, I would like to thank the audience for joining us today and the panelists for sharing their expertise. Please remember to use the resources and support around you through these times. Uh, even with physical isolation, we can still continue to support each other, inshallah. And um, make sure to tune into our next webinar, which will be on April 16th. Um, and yeah, that's about it. Thank you so much, everyone, and take care, and we'll see you soon. Sabrina, can we have a dua by Sister Fatima, if you don't mind? Just yeah, that would be great. Sister Fatima, if you'd yeah, like yeah. to lead us in a dua really quick. No, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, that we are able to do this successful, and may it benefit each one of us and the whole nation, because we are here to help. So and we thank Almighty Allah for letting us go through this successful without any problem. And so we just um, want to say Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. And I just want to say Rabbana Atina fi dunya asanatan wa fil akhirati asanatan wa kinna azaban And we want to read Surah al fatiha Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Ar Rahmanir Rahim. Maliki Yawmiddin. إياك الحبد وإياك نصرين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين السلام عليكم and then I do have a question is because we went through all this information is everyone going to have access to that all the people attending yes so inshallah tomorrow morning um, we will be providing the recording and the list of resources on our Facebook pages and websites. Uh, those websites will be projecttaqwa.org and illinoismuslims.org. Uh, and also, Chris, if you just want to take just a few minutes really quick to go over the census information, you can go ahead and do that now. Oh, sure. Um, so um, a lot of you might have already been receiving um, letters from the Census Bureau, maybe quite a few, um, asking you to fill out the census. And so the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition, which I I'm a census fellow for, we're focusing on making sure that our community, but all hearts to count communities, which hit a lot of our communities um, are counted. Uh, the census affects all of the resources that we get in our communities in times like these, for example, to schools, how much money they receive, um, businesses, uh, redistricting our political power. It affects everything for the next 10 years. Um, and like the, the visual says the census is nine questions and it takes five minutes and so you could do it online you could do it over the phone and over the phone they do have options for multiple languages so you could have someone from the census bureau help translate um all the questions and then you could also do it written um with the form that you received uh and so we want to just make sure that all of us are counted regardless of our race ethnicity, religious background, uh, whether we're undocumented, citizens, green card holders, visiting refugees, um, every single person, baby, um, all the way from newborns to um, those that alhamdulillah are um, older, um, we want to be counted. And so if you want more information, visit us at www.illinoismuslimcivicoalition.org slash census 2020. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, yeah. And last but not least, we did mention the CARE Coalition form in the beginning of our presentation. Um, Chris, did you also want to go ahead and explain this a little bit? Sure. So this is um, what I mentioned I'm doing as a way to 
continue to be engaged with the community and to help others. And so the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition um, set up Care Coalition, um, and it's for a time like this. Um, and we have many, many partners alhamdulillah, that are helping us to get the word out and to connect individuals. But our job mainly is to connect those that can give care to those that need care, whether that is um, financial assistance or getting groceries to your home. Um, uh, and there's a long list of a lot of things that people might be in need of. And especially as time goes on, um, might become more and more severe. And so please, please, please use our hotline that you see on the screen or the URL at the bottom, the bit.ly link to fill out a form and let us know if you have extra time and would like to volunteer um, or if you are in need yourself and please share with all of your circles. Um, we wanna make sure that we're connecting those that need care to those that can give care um, and just making sure that we're all caring for each other um, in this time. So again, like Sabrina said, um, everyone will be getting all this information soon in email. So thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. And again, thank you all, everyone. Uh, we're now going to close out and sign off. Uh, so I hope tonight was uh, beneficial to all of you. Um, and I look forward to seeing you at the next webinar, inshallah. All right. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.